What do we believe? I'm not what I do. Wow. I'm not what I have. Wow. Wow, I am the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take that from me. Amen. I don't have to worry. Wave it off. Point to yourself. I will follow the Son and the Holy Spirit will reside in me. To God be the glory. Amen. Give yourself a hand. Wow. Very powerful, very powerful. All right, I want to get ready to jump into this word today. We, we've been in this series. You guys are familiar with the, with the series at this point. It's called uh, Finishing Strong. And we are uh, in this place in this series where we're actually coming to an end. We started in January. If you're visiting for the first time, you want to go back and look at the series. It's on the app. It's on our website. You can go back and look at these sermons because they do literally build on top of each other. But what we've been doing is we've been going through the life of David and looking at him as he starts his new thing. And this is what we know. This is what we have come to know. We're looking at Isaiah as well. And what God tells us is that God is always doing something in every one of our lives. And it really comes down to whether or not we can finish strong. Amen. And what we've been learning from David is life has ups and downs and there have been all these different situations, all these things that will trip us up and will stop us in, in some ways, not even from finishing strong, but from finishing at all. And so what we want to do is we want to keep going forward in the series. We're in 2 Samuel chapter 23. Last week we looked at the first six verses, first five, six verses of 2 Samuel. I want to pick up in verse 8. I want to begin to look at these mighty men, David's mighty men, mighty warriors. That's what they were called. I want to begin to look at David's mighty men. And I'm believing that God is going to show us the key to being mighty. How many of you would like to be mighty? How many of you like to, in your new thing, come on, put your hands together if you want to be mighty. Amen. And so what David is, is the leader of these men. And these men are documented in the history of the Bible, in the history of the world, as mighty men. And what I want to do is I want to peel through these scriptures today, and I want to see what it takes in order for us to finish strong. In order for us to finish strong, we need to be mighty. So how do we tap into being mighty? Okay, so I want to read this now. I'm going to tell you now. We talked about humbleness last week, how important it is to be humble before the Lord. And I'm about to tell, I'm telling you this, God is humbling me right now because these names that I'm have to read, <laughs> they, okay, we, you'll see, you'll see, you'll see. All right. So I stand before you humbled. Uh, it's, I have a very loose command of the English language. And these words are hard. And so don't laugh. What are you laughing for? Charlita, what are you laughing at? Okay, okay. These are the names of David's. I know how to say that name. David's. What is this? Mighty warriors. The mighty men of David. Josh Heb, Bas Hebeth. A Ta Kamonite. Was chief of the three. He raised his spear against 800 men whom he killed in one encounter. I want you guys to notice one thing. I get excited when I get, I can pronounce the words. So I get loud, but then when I get, when I can't pronounce them, I'm going to get a little lower and try to mow through it. You know, I, I wish I could say this like I write sometimes when I can't spell something. You just kind of, yeah, yeah. Next to him was Eleazar, son of uh, uh, Dodai, uh, the Ahohite, as as one of the three mighty warriors, he was with David when they taunted the Philistines gathered at Pass uh, Demim De De for battle. Then the Israelites retreated, but Eleazar stood his ground and struck down the Philistines till his 
hand grew tired and froze to the sword. And I did a little bit of research on this. This is a real thing during that time when people fought with swords. They would use it for so long and combination of blood and just the muscles being tight on the, on the sword would literally freeze your hand around it. And you'd have to literally separate your hand away from it. And I'm guessing after you kill, you know, a couple hundred people swinging the sword that your hand probably freezes on it. So Yahweh brought about a great victory that day. The troops returned to Eleazar, but only to strip the dead. Next to him was Shema, son of Agi, the Harriot, right? Harriot. When the Philistines banded together at the place where there was a field full of lentils, Israel's troops fled from them, but Shema took his stand in the middle of the field. He defended it and struck the Philistines down, and the Lord brought about a great victory. During harvest time, three of the 30 chief warriors came down to David at the cave of uh, Adullam. This is that cave that we remember back in 1 Samuel, I think it was chapter 22, where David went to this cave and all those people came to him and began to allow him to be their leader. While a band of Philistines was encamped in the valley of Rephim, at the time David was in the stronghold and the Philistine garrison was at Bethlehem. Hey Amen. We got through it. Amen. Amen. Why don't y'all give God a hand for his word? <laughs> Father God, we come to you now in the name of your son, Yeshua, the Christ Lord. We are so humbled by your presence, uh, by the level of detail that you put inside of your word, by the nuggets that you have placed inside of your word today. And it is our prayer, God, that you will show us the secret, the keys to becoming mighty in our new thing and to becoming mighty in the things that you have called us to do and to becoming mighty really in our old things and in all things. Lord, we want to be mighty. We want to represent you in a mighty way today. And so, Lord, I pray that you would speak to our heart, that you will remove all of the junk that we consider to be mighty and that you would begin to speak to us today around how we are to be mighty men, mighty warriors of God today. I pray, God, that you allow us to to see this word mighty from a different perspective today. And we pray this in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. To God be the glory. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I'm not sure how many of you guys are familiar with orchestras or uh, symphonies, but probably the, the most famous composer uh, in the United States history probably not in the world, you know, you have Bach and Beethoven, all these other uh, great composers, but with respect to the United States of America, there's one name that if you are in orchestra, if you are, if you play an instrument, if you strive to be a part of a, an orchestra and be great at what you're doing, that you want to, you know about this guy. His name is Leonard Bernstein, and he has gone on to be with the Lord. He was a believer, but he spent his life understanding music and how you put different types of instruments together in order to make a beautiful score. He did the score for West Side Story. He went to Harvard. He, he has all the credentials that makes him a great composer. He, he understands that there are Four, and I, I kind of get deep into this thing when God starts to pull me into it, but there, there are these four specific areas, somewhere between 80 to 100 people in an orchestra, in a symphony, and they're divided into four distinct areas. Uh, you have your string instruments, and they're responsible for the melody. These are the instruments that are closest to the voice, so this is where we get the soprano sound from, the alto sound, and the, and the tenor sound. This is, these instruments, they almost speak like voices. They're responsible for creating a melody. Then you have the percussion. And they have an important job as well. Their job is to keep the rhythm, to keep the, the, the pace of the orchestra. You, you have also uh, the brass. 
And, and what they're responsible for is giving texture, uh, allowing for us to, to hear the power. You know, when those horns, they blow and they just, they give us power and texture. And then you have the, uh, the woodwind instruments. And those instruments, they provide balance. So they kind of tie the whole thing together. And you can just kind of hear them between the power of the horns and the, the beat and the rhythm of the percussion and, and the melody of the strings. And you bring all this stuff together in order to create a beautiful sound. They call it a score. And, and no one did it better in the history of American composing than Brother Leonard. So, so in an interview one time, they came to Brother Leonard and they said, what is, what is the hardest instrument to play? Of, of the four sections with all these roles that they have to play and all the jobs that they have to do in order to create the rhythm and, and in order to bring in the color and the balance and the texture and the power and, and all these things. You got 80 to 100 instruments there. And he says, what is the hardest instrument to play out of all of those instruments, all of them being important? And without even thinking twice about it, he said, the hardest instrument to play is the second fiddle. The second fiddle. Not the lead fiddle. Not the drum. Not the instruments that we're you know, more accustomed to. Not the saxophone. Not the clarinet. He said the hardest person to find, the hardest instrument to control in the course of any orchestra is the people, the people in the section that play the second fiddle. It's the amazing thing. The second fiddle is not a different instrument. It's the same instrument as the first fiddle. It's a violin. It's the same exact instrument as the first fiddle. But it takes a different kind of person to be able to play the second fiddle. It takes a person that is mighty in order to be able to play the second fiddle. Now, we tend to think that the mighty person would be the one who's leading the solo the, 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 the first fiddle, the first violin, the one, the people that stand up and they do this beautiful thing while those people are sitting down behind them and playing the background and the chorus. But what he begins to communicate to us is that the thing that makes this second filler so mighty, that makes this second filler so great, that brings the entire orchestra together and makes the entire orchestra become great is the ability for the people, for some people to just be led. For some people to just sit back even though they have the same credentials and went to the same school and can play just as good as the person that's playing the first fiddle. For that person to sit down and take a lesser role and sit back and allow for somebody else to get the shine and for somebody and to understand, listen, when they clapping for you, they're not just clapping for the one that's playing the, the first fiddle. They're not just clapping for the, the, the main violinist. They're not just clapping for the percussionist. They're not just uh, clapping for the woodwind person. But when they clap at the end and they yell encore, it's because they want the second fiddle, the first fiddle, the, the drum, the percussion, the harp, and everything else. And your ability in your new thing to be able to operate in a level of humility, to be able to be a second fiddle from time to time, until it's time for you to lead, in order for you to, to sit back in a job and allow for the person that's been given the, the authority of being the principal or the boss or whatever the leader is inside of your life, for you to sit down in a church, for you to sit down in a ministry and be able to allow. For, I know there's a lot of things you want to do with the men's ministry, but the men's ministry has a leader of the men's ministry. And so can you come into the men's ministry? Can you come into the women's ministry? Can you come into uplift ministry? Can you come on the job for the first day? Can you come into a marriage for the first day? And understand that there are going to be some times when your, your best performance the mighty performance, the thing that you did greatest was to sit back and allow for somebody else to lead and that you can follow, that you can put somebody else first, that you can think about more than yourself. 
That when things get good and, and when people who are in the first uh, uh, seat, they begin to get applause, that you can also be happy for them. And that you can understand that they are able to do the thing that, that they're doing because you are mighty enough to be able to do the thing that you're doing. To be able to get to the place where you understand that everybody in the orchestra can't be a lead violinist. There's other instruments. and There's some people who have to support, who have to be in the background. There's some people who, are, and listen, to be honest with you, for some of us, there's some training that you need. When God called me in 2005 to be a pastor, he told me, listen, you are a pastor. He told me, you're a pastor. I didn't go out the next day and start a church. We're talking about nine years of sitting, and I love those, nine of the best years of my life of playing second fiddle. So, sometimes playing second fiddle to somebody who I didn't think was a first fiddle. But learning from that person as I play second fiddle, how, how to be a better first fiddle, how to be better, how to not, okay, don't do that. All right, I'm going to do this, but hey, I learned just as much of what not to do playing second fiddle as I did learn what to do playing second fiddle. Nine years. Second fiddle, best time of my life. Set back and I learned, listen, I would not be the pastor I am today if I had to set back for those nine years and play second fiddle to multiple ministers, to multiple ministries. You could ask me to do anything. It, there was no job that was beneath me. I, trained, I took the trash out and guess what I'm doing today? I'll take the trash out because what you learn being second fiddle changes your perspective. I kind of went into this thing seeing pastors in one way and becoming a second fiddler in the background, an associate person sitting, waiting to preach. I got a, a hunger for the Word of God. I wanted to get into the Word of God. When Bible study happened, I was a second fiddle. And since I was a minister called to be a minister, I was the first person at the Bible study. Not to teach it because... Because teaching it wasn't where it was. It was about coming in and sitting down under the person that God put in place and allowing for that person to teach me sometimes what I already knew, but I just needed to hear it again. And sometimes what they said, I questioned, and it, it forced me to go and look stuff up. And, hey, sometimes I found out what they said wasn't right. And sometimes I found what they said was exactly right. And either way, I walked away being a second filler for that day learning Learning something. And, and listen, let me talk to you now. Because as I did that, you know what start, started to happen? I began to get a little bit more mighty. Some of those things, some of those nerves that I had about being a pastor, about starting a church, about planning a church, about preaching a word, about standing before you. Some of those things that I thought about, it took some time for me to get through some past things, some condemnation, some stuff that I messed up on. I needed to sit down. It took some time for me to get myself in a position where I could sit before a woman or sit before a family or sit before a child and be able to opine and not be judgmental and not try to take advantage of the situation. It took time, and, and this is where I learned it at. Being a second fiddle is where I learned how to be the pastor that you have right in front of you today. But I just don't apply that at the job. There's not been a job that I've been on, not the, not the job of being a pastor, but there's not been a job that I've been on where I walked in and the person that was assigned, the leader, was, was the person I thought was the best person for the job. With, with the exception of my current position, most of the time, I looked at this person, I felt like I could do the job better. I could play the notes better. I could play the notes stronger. I could, be, I could be a better leader. I could do it better. And most of you, most of you, you struggle with this. Playing second fiddle at a place where you're doing the work and your boss is getting the credit and your boss may not be giving you whatever it is, the accolades that you need and he may be or she may be holding you accountable and making you feel like they're ungrateful and you get to this place where you, you get so frustrated playing second fiddle. But this is what I'm here to tell you today. The strength in who you are. The strength in who you are. The mightiness in what you need to be, it comes for playing second fiddle and not playing first fiddle. And here's a challenge. I want you guys to see this. There's a challenge with being second fiddle. Matter of fact, most of us would admit 
Being second fiddle is hard. Why is it hard? Now, we don't want to admit why it's hard, but we'll admit that it is hard. The reason why it's hard is because it's not modeled. Hey, see, some of us grew up in houses where parents refused to play second fiddle. Well, they argued about every little thing, trying to exert their power. Nobody. I'm not saying the man is the first filler or the woman is the first filler. What I'm saying is there ought to be handoffs. Sometimes on this particular thing, I'm first fiddle, and, I, and, and you have to kind of fall back into second fiddle. Sometimes on this other thing, you have more experience, more knowledge. You saw this better growing up. You went to school for this. So guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to fall back to second fiddle, and I'm going to let you handle the first fiddle on this thing. And that's how all beautiful couples work. That's how all beautiful businesses work. And you know what they are? Couples that master this are mighty. People at work that master this are mighty. People, you see them inside. There's something special about these people, and it's not the way they lead. But it's the way they follow. And this is a mess for us because I, you go, go Google right now. Books about leadership. Millions of books about leadership. Google books about following. Hardly none. None exists. You can't find a book on how to be a great follower. Everybody in here wants people to follow them but won't like somebody else's thing or follow somebody else because I don't want their followers to grow more than my followers. We say in a society where being second fiddle is akin to being a loser. But here's the reality. Whether you choose to play second fiddle or not, everybody in this room has to play second fiddle in some area of your life. So become, understanding how to be second fiddle, getting rid of this thing, that the fact that it's not been modeled right, getting rid of your pride. You believing that you ought to be the lead person all the time. You believing that you ought to be the principal. You believing that you ought, this, uh, you ought to be the boss. You'll be surprised how many times I talk to people who thought they were supposed to be the boss. They were supposed to be the principal. They were supposed to have been the person in charge. And after they, get the after they do everything they can to get the title, they realize, I wish I would have just been a second fiddler for a little while longer. But, but this pride gets in. Not just pride, becoming a second fill is hard because selfishness. I, I want to join the church, but I want them to do this program. So I walk into the church. I'm not even a member with suggestions. I haven't even been at church consistently, and now I want to lead something. I want to walk into the door and be first fiddler instead of coming in, having a seat, getting up under the teaching, understanding what the different offices are and what the different ministries are. And then, listen, this is what you have to do. Picking up a hammer and going to help somebody else build something. Instead of you having to be the person that's telling everybody what to build, everybody what to, you know, it's, it's an amazing thing to be able to come in. You're mighty. Let me tell you something. The pastor considers you mighty when you come in and pick up a hammer and willing to get under the vision of what we're doing here at Uplift. The ministry leaders consider you mighty. You are a rare person when you want to come in and get under the vision of what's going on. Your boss at work. That's why he, he or she favors those two or three people that you don't like. It's not the brown nosing that you call it. It's the fact that they play second fiddle well. That they sit back and they are considered in the boss's eyes as mighty. And some of you are managers and leaders and you know exactly what I'm talking about. You can't do nothing with a lead person all the time that should be in the second fiddle position. Because what ends up happening is they end up apologizing a lot because they go play notes that they shouldn't play. And they do things that they're not capable of doing. And they mess up the entire orchestra because instead of being second fiddle, they jumped out in the lead and didn't know what they were doing. Is this making sense? Not, not, not just selfishness. Here's the big one right here. Jealousy. I, 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 
I, I want that first fill. I got to have that first fill. She, she don't deserve that first fill. I deserve that first fill. I want what she has. I want to get that accolade. I want to get that attention. I want that job. I want that title. And, and listen, what happens is when we do not play second fiddle, we start to do a whole lot of bad things. We start to gossip. We start to do a whole lot of bad. We, try, we start dig what, what they would say in the old church. We start to dig in ditches. And you know what happens when you dig the ditch? When you're walking through there at night, you fall in the ditch. And you are the person. I'm just trying to save you. I'm, I'm trying to get you to the place where you can be mighty. But, but, but not just uh, mighty. It's hard. But, but you also got to look at the fact that playing second fiddle, it requires for you to have Humility. You have to be able to be unselfish. Everything can't be about you. You have to be able to look at what somebody else is trying to do. You want people, when you are designated to be the first fiddler, you want second fiddlers to come and help you and understand, and you better not ask me no questions, and you better not buy, just do what I say. Just I, I'm, I'm the lead. I'm the, I just need you to come in and be a second fiddler. But when it comes time for you to be a second fiddler, you, listen, you, un, you, you want to be selfish. You want to tell people how they're supposed to do it, when they're supposed to do it. Here's a better, I got another idea. Here's a better way to do it. Be be becoming a, 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 a second filler requires submission. It requires you saying, you are my leader. <laughs> you are my pastor. You are my husband. You are my wife. You are my parent. You are my child. It requires for us to get to this place where we submit to people. Why? Because we love them. It's not about how old you are, how long you've been. That's just, that's just a measure of how long you've been on the earth. I know some young people that are much wiser than people who've been on the earth for a long period of time. It requires us to submit to somebody, even when we have the degrees and they don't have the degrees even when we feel like somebody else put them in office or put them in the position and they didn't deserve it, we still have to submit to that person because they are our leader. It, not just submission, but it requires you to be humble. We talked about being humble to the Lord yesterday, but we got to be humble to... The second fielder has to learn how to be humble to the people that they work with, to the people that they're married to, to the people that they're parenting be, be, being second fiddle work, requires us to have obedience. What does that mean? You got to do what you've been prescribed to do. The second fiddle can't just go off on a, 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 I don't care how good it sounds or how good it is. You can't just go off and do your solo thing. You can't just jump up and start doing what you wish that the first fiddler would have done. But you have to get to the place where you humble yourself to the point of being obedient to what the notes on the page, to what the vision and the mission or wherever you're in, to what the mate or to what the child or to what the parent has prescribed to you. And it takes a whole lot of sacra sacrifice. But if you can master this humility thing, you can become mighty. God can use you. People at work can use you. God can take you from the entry level to the, the top level. God can take your marriage from a bunch of disagreement to a beautiful, mighty marriage. So, so here's the question. How, how, do we, how do we become mighty? I want you guys to see this now. I'm looking at these two verses in Samuel. One in 1 Samuel 22, one in 2 Samuel 23. This is talking about the same guys. The mighty men started with David in that, in that cave, outside of that cave. And, and this is what the word of God says. All those who were in, this, this is what the mighty men were then. They were in distress. They were in debt. They were discontented. Now, now I want you guys to see this. Before they were mighty, they were a mess. When David 
got into these guys, before David got into these guys' life, when they came to David, they came with issues. They came with problems. They were not ready to be leads. They, many of them thought they were ready to be leads, and that's why they were in distress. Many of them thought that they were able to buy this thing and do this thing. That's why many of them were in debt. Many of them thought that they had it all together, but they didn't. That's why many of them were discontented. None of them were in the place where God had them. And then all of a sudden, we look down in 2 Samuel 23, just one book later. These same people that were in distress, these same people that were in debt, these same people that were discontented, now God is calling them for the rest of their life. Mighty warriors. The same people who were at best second fillers, right? Many of them thought, hey man, I probably can be David. I, I should be David. I can do, I can fight just as good as David. I'm a small, I'm old. David would have been a young man. I'm older than David. These were men with families. It was 400 of them. But some way or another, they get from being this distressed, in debt, discontented people to being mighty warriors of God. And, and, and this is how they do it. They understand that humility is what makes them mighty. And so what they do is they gathered around David. They made David the first fiddler. And they all, regardless of how strong they were, how old they were, how much experience they had, how long they have done what, how much better they understood the desert, the land, the wilderness, and all this stuff, whatever their special gifts was, whatever their, here's, here's a church word for you, whatever their anointing was, They set all that stuff to the side because they realized that in reality, I, I'm under distress. In reality, although I believe I can run this job, I'm in debt. In reality, I'm discontented. And the reality of it is as they gathered around David and as they allowed him to become their leader and as they picked up the, the second fiddle and they began to play whatever it is that David asked them to play and they began to be obedient to David and they allowed for humility to set in and they decided not to be selfish and they submitted and they became humble and they became obedient and they sacrificed God then made them mighty this is what Peter's saying we we looked at these verses the other day he says you who are younger now, now I want you to understand what this word younger means in the Greek it means it's the word neo so it's not just about age it's about experience. You know, sometimes, you know, I play as a fraternity. Sometimes we bring some guys to the grad chapter. They are older than you, but they are less in knowledge about the fraternity. So they are neos, even though they are older than you. They are second fillers. Go to the kitchen, prepare the meals, get the cups, second fill. You, I know you're old enough to be my granddaddy, but head on back to that kitchen, sir, and get the, get the plates, get the bread, bring it on out here and set it up right there. And listen, you better do it quickly, too. And what Peter, using this word neo, is explaining to us is when you are in a job, it doesn't matter how long you've been around a job, it doesn't matter how high you believe that you are in your own mind, it doesn't matter about the pride, the jealousy, or any of that stuff that stops us from being the second filler. What he's saying to us is if you are in this place of being the, young, the, 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 the subordinate person, this is what I need you to do. I need you to submit yourselves to your elders. Who is he talking to? All second fillers in the room. All the people in the room who play second filler. All the people in the room who have a boss. All the people in the room who go to a church who are part of a ministry. All the people in the room who have a parent. All the people in the room who have a mate. All the people in the room. He's talking to all the people in the room who are Christians. And what he's saying is, all of you, this is what I need you to do. Clothe yourself with humility. Toward who? One another. This is why I need you to do it because as we've been teaching over and over again, God opposes the proud. God does not like the proud. God does not like the person that's supposed to be playing second filler and he instead is being messy and trying to make things hard for the first filler or trying to outshine the first filler or trying to take over the first filler's job. God opposes those people who are proud, who are always trying to be the first filler when you're supposed to be the second filler. And this doesn't have anything to do with working hard. You ought to work hard. You ought to try, you ought to work as if you're working unto the Lord everything that you do. But the motive of your work, 
The reason why you work hard ought to be to support the team, to support the leader, to be there for the leader, and not to, you know, take the leader's job or to get the leader fired or to get or, or to take this school, this thing over. Oh Lord, I, I heard school. Or to take this school over. He says, This is what I need you to do. I need you to clothe yourself with humility because what happens when you when you operate in humility you open up the favor you become mighty before the lord you open up the favor of god you're trying to open up favor on your own and making enemies the whole way and closing doors the whole way and burning bridges the whole way and then finally when you back your way into that job into that situation you realize that the person that you thought wasn't doing a good job that you could do a better job then that there's a whole lot of politics and a whole lot of sex fillers trying to be first filler and a whole lot of garbage and mess and restrictions and red tape and all kind of stuff going on that the job that you've been fighting for is not the job and that you were actually a second filler who should have stayed second filler listen Jesus through his life Shows us exactly what it means to be mighty by being a second filler. Jesus, Yeshua, the one that we look up to, the one that we worship, we're all followers of Yeshua. And what he does throughout his entire ministry is he shows up as a second filler time and time again. And when you look at the actual reason why Jesus was even sent to the earth, it was so he can play Second fill. Look, look what Paul does. Paul begins to explain to the Philippian church. And listen, he begins to talk to us all today. You have an opportunity to walk out of here mighty. You have an opportunity to have a mighty marriage, to have a mighty parent relationship. You have the opportunity to go back to work and become mighty. Every single person in this room, you have the exact same opportunity because being mighty has nothing to do with your degree. Being mighty has nothing to do with how many years you worked in a job. Being mighty has nothing to do with how smart you are. Being mighty has nothing to do even with how hard you work. Being mighty is all about your ability to do like these men did with David, to exhibit humility, to be unselfish, to submit, to be humble, to be o- obedient, to, to sacrifice. L- look what Jesus shows. He says, Paul says, do, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Selfish ambition, vain conceit. That's first filler stuff. That's me trying to lead. That's me trying to do it my way. Humility is about being unselfish. This is what Paul is teaching us. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Stop trying to get your way all the time. Stop cutting, backbiting, gossiping, doing whatever you can in order to get your way. Understand that God has put everybody in place. There's not a, the Bible said there's not a person that, that's in place that God hadn't allowed to be in place. And regardless of who that is in place, you are supposed to exercise Humility. You are supposed to clothe yourself with humility. He says, rather, instead of selfish ambition, trying to be the lead guitarist, trying to be the lead violinist, well, you know, it's more like this. What, what, what you have to do rather than doing that is in humility. You have to value others above yourself. In other words, you can't, it can't be about you every time. It can't be about you every, every situation, every place you go. It can't be about you at work, at home, at church. can't be about you. you it, I'm just saying, if you were to just think about the, the conflict that you have inside of your life, does that conflict follow you from one second field of place to the next, sec, next second field of place? Because everywhere you go, you want to come in and lead. 
You want to come in and brag. You want to come in and talk about how great you were and everything that you did. No, no, no. What he says is, instead, I need you to be unselfish. I need you not to be selfish. I need you to be unselfish. I need you not make it about you. I need you to make it about others. I need you to have humility. I need you to think about other people instead of always trying to get your way. Not looking out for your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the other person. He says, what he says in verse 5, he says, in your relationships with one another, in your work relationships, in your home relationships, in your relationships with one another, this is what you have to do. You have to have the same mindset as Christ Yeshua. You have to get to this place where you are, you have this humility in everything that you do. Who? Look what it says. Who being in the very nature of Elohim did not consider equality with Elohim as something to be used to his own advantage. I want you guys to understand this. He was with God. He was from God. He was was there with God. He's a part of the Trinity. He was there with God. And when they came and said, hey, we need somebody to go back. He didn't say, well, I'm God too. Why would you send me back? Or I need to be up top, send the Holy Spirit back. Or God the Father, why don't you go back? Why I got to put on the body? What he did was he operated in humility. He didn't say he wasn't supposed to do it, but instead he submitted. It says, rather, he made himself nothing. He submitted He did everything that it took in order to allow the first filler to do his job. He understood it's going to require a second filler. Like, we can't save this mankind with two first fillers, with three first fillers. I'm going to need for two of you guys to be the first filler, and I'm going to be the second filler. I'm going to put on the flesh. I'm going to come through the womb. I'm going to walk the earth. I'm going to be tempted by the devil. I'm going to live the perfect life, the, the perfect lamb that will be slain. I'm going to do everything, and I'm still at the end of this going to be treated like a second hand fiddle they're going to spit on me beat me humiliate me nail me to a cross look what it said he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness and being found in the appearance as a man He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, sacrifice, even death on the cross. But that's not how the story ended. He played second fiddler. He operated in humility. He was unselfish. He he submitted. He he came back in flesh. He humbled himself. He was obedient to sacrifice, but that is not how the story ended. This is what God did. God, therefore, therefore Elohim, God, exalted him. God made him mighty because he allowed himself to be humble because he allowed himself to be unselfish because he allowed himself to submit because he allowed himself to be obedient because he sacrificed because he walked and clothed himself in humility not for himself but for you and for you and for you and for me because he made humility his way because he clothed himself in humility. God made him mighty. And that is what God wants to do for each and every one of you. I I don't care how old you are. I know it's hard. Imagine how hard it was. I'm not saying having humility is easy. Jesus' route to the cross is not an easy route to the cross. But it ends with him being the mighty Savior that we serve. He is the mighty risen Lord that we serve. He is so mighty that the reward that he received, we received. That's how mighty he was. That because he had humility, because he walked in humility, because of his sacrifice, now we all can walk in humility. Now we all can walk before the Lord. 
So this week. I have a simple question for you. Are you uh, a mighty person? What, what is God saying to you? About the way you play second filler. What is God saying to you about the pride? About jealousy? About what is God revealing? I'm believing that God is saying something to you today. That he's revealing something to you today. About something that you might have called drive. You know, the world. We put all these little, little foolish hustle. We put all these little things. on Hustle ain't in the Bible, man. You know, if you're a believer of Christ, we have another language. It's called humble. You, you need to replace hustle with humility. Because all your hustling has not gotten you anywhere. You like Scooby-Doo running, running fast, going nowhere. Just running, your feet just running, and you're just getting tired as you can be. And the reality of it is, is that God, just like he did with Christ, he wants to make you mighty. But in order for him to make you mighty, it's going to require for you to make him the first filler. And allow yourself to be second filler. What does that mean? For you to get inside of your Bible. For you to understand that you've been called to be, not what the world says about you, but you've been called to be a person of humility. That the way that you're going to get to the, the success that you're looking for, the way that you're going to be mighty, is not through any of this stuff the world tells you that it'll never work. It's not lasting. You can't keep it going. At some point, you're going to crash, burn, and fail. But those people who are in your life, the ones that were operating in humility, those are the ones that you respect. Those are the ones, the grandmother that was so humble and submitted and took care of everybody else and put everybody else first and was so obedient and sacrificed so much. That's the person. That's the person that you consider to be mighty. Not these loud mouth big mouth people bragging and you don't consider them to be mighty you consider them to be a mess and so in order for us to become mighty we've got to pick up the second filler allow Yeshua to be the first filler and then we follow the script that he gives us and not the script that the world gives us and that all can happen today because today we can make this declaration that it's my humility that makes me mighty. It's not any of that stuff that we've been taught and all that 40, 48 ways to get powerful and persuade people in all those books. You're wasting time. Open the Bible. You're spending all that time in all these books, but the true principles that you need in order to be successful and to finish strong and in order to be mighty... Those are the principles that are inside of the Bible and inside of Yeshua's life and inside of the word that we call the infallible word of God. And I want you guys to make this declaration today. It's my humility that makes me mighty. Come on. You guys say it. It's my humility that makes me mighty. Say it like you believe it. It's my humility that makes me mighty. Now say it like you mean it. Hey, this is what I'm believing. That as you're making that declaration over your life, that God is beginning to move in a mighty way. That God is beginning to, to bring that might inside of you. He's beginning to give you the things that you need. He's, he's beginning to orchestrate some things inside of your life. And as you pick up the second filler in your marriage, as you pick up the second fiddle at work, as you pick up the second fiddle at this church, as you pick up the second fiddle, listen, you don't have to be fussing with your family all the time. Put down the first fiddle. They want to play first fiddle, let them play. 
You support them. You do the things that you need to do in order to keep. That's what Big Mama did. She did the things that needed to be done in order to keep the family together. You know what Big Mama did a lot of times? I'm talking to somebody, including myself. She played second fiddle. She didn't always throw around the fact that she was grandmama or great-grandmama. But sometimes she sat back and she listened to nephews. And sometimes she sat back and she listened to grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and wanted to understand and play second fiddle. And I'm believing that as you make this declaration of your life, that God is, as the word of God says, he's creating you into a mighty, mighty warrior. To God be the glory. Amen. Amen. If you're here today and you want to uh, give your life to Christ, if you want to make him the first filler in your life, this is the first step for all of us. If you've been away from God, you need to come back. It's time for you to put the first fiddle down. It's time for you to pick up the second fiddle. It starts with a commitment to God. I'm opening this altar up for you online as well. Feel free to drop in the chat if you're interested in being baptized, if you're interested in giving your life to Christ, if you're interested in giving your life back to Christ. You realize that you took the fiddle out of his hand. You've been playing your own music, and the reality of it is it stinks. And now it's time for you to give it back to the Lord. This altar is open for you today. If you're in need of prayer, this second fiddle thing, this humility thing, not an easy thing to do. I want to open up the altar today for you for prayer. If you're looking for a church home, I know a lot of times why people don't join churches is because they want to be first fiddle. They don't want to, listen, come on in. We need some fiddlers. We need some second fiddlers. We need some people that can come and help us be everything that God has called us to be. You don't have to wait. We're not going to change. We're going to be the same way consistently. Trust me. To God be the glory. Amen.